I appreciate all of you spending your time here this morning uh, learning about chanterelles in Texas, presented by our very own Patrick Harris, who's uh, a board member and helped me out with the group since the very beginning. So uh, he's been in it <laughs> with me uh, since before the association was formed, and we're just a ragtag group of Facebook uh, mushroom hunters. <laughs> 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 And from that, we've kind of evolved into the organization we are now. And I'm really proud to have him teach this class for us here today. So everybody, please give him one. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, everybody, for being here and all the people in Zoom tuning in. Um, my name is uh, Patrick Harris. For those who don't know me, uh, I am not an expert in this field. I'm not a uh, professional. I'm just an amateur that really loves the uh, interest of mycology. And uh, I've been working with mushrooms uh, on a uh, cultivation and foraging basis since 2006. Um, so all of my experience is just based on my hobby and my passion for it. Um, so uh, I really, really like chanterelles. Uh, they're one of my favorite mushrooms uh, just to look at, to hunt, they're really beautiful. Uh, this picture is taken by a, a Daniel Cunningham on a foray that we went uh, on out in East Texas. And uh, there was just absolutely chanterelles everywhere. And uh, it was a really memorable, just kind of uh, one of those experiences, you know, that like sticks with you for many years. So I hope that through this presentation, I can kind of engender some interest uh, in chanterelles uh, for people that might be having a hard time finding them. Um, and, uh, you know, locating them. They are around. They are definitely in the DFW area, too, in the Metroplex. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to hunt them, uh, I try to identify them, try to key them, and that's what we'll go over in this presentation. It's basically, you know, how do you locate chanterelles, um, and then once you do, where are the steps to take to actually try and, and get close to identification? Um, and uh, go ahead. Next slide. All right, so it's a Cantharellus is a really, really big genus. Um, it was at one point comprised of about 400 different species. And then they narrowed that down a lot uh, after a lot of work with um, the analysis of the genetics in Chanterelles. Uh, molecular analysis uh, kind of really set things straight in terms of the genus. So now worldwide, there's about somewhere between 70 and 90 confirmed species instead of 400. Uh, and 29 of those species are actually uh, here and native to North America. Um, and in Texas, we have uh, at least 10 or 12 of these 29 species. So there's a good variety of chanterelles in Texas uh, that represent kind of uh, the broader distribution of species in North America, some that occur, um, you know, in the eastern seaboard closer to the Appalachian Mountains and some that are kind of like um, closer to the Gulf Coast. Um, and, and some that are even a little bit closer to uh, the Rockies, but on like the eastern side of the Rockies. So here there's like a kind of transition zone between all these different species that makes uh, Texas a really interesting place to uh, hunt chanterelles. And so for the people that are involved in the taxonomic work, Texas kind of represents to um, a space where there's some cryptic species complex possibly and uh, some discovery to be made in terms of taxonomy. Uh, one of the kind of experts of North American chanterelles is, is uh, he's from Texas, right? David P. Lewis? Yes. Yeah. He is, uh, um, yeah. I know he lives in Texas. I didn't know if he was actually from yeah, here. Yeah, the guy is named after him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's got a chanterelle named after him. Um, another one of the experts uh, would be, uh, he's not from North America, um, but he's in France. His name is uh, Bart Boyk. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but he's basically the world's foremost expert on the genus right now. Um, his publications have kind of like redefined uh, the species uh, in the genus pretty majorly. Um, and the reason why uh, chanterelles seem to be such an area of interest um, more recently is just because of the, the fact that for a long time, they weren't really looked at as exciting taxonomically. Everybody thought that they were kind of the same thing. Um, a lot of chanterelles got thrown into Cibarius, uh, and that was kind of what was for a long time thought to be the major clay that involves yellow chanterelles. Um, people really figured out quickly, though, that um, 
you know, once genetic analysis came around that there's like a whole treasure trove of diversity within them. So, um, I mean, obviously they're, you know, really highly desirable, highly treasured mushroom uh, by the public. Uh, I believe like the North American market is a multi-million dollar industry and probably worldwide at this point, Shinrels are a billion dollar industry, at least a billion dollars. Um, and it's just because the culinary, uh, they're so prized. Uh, they're really delicious. Uh, they have kind of like a fruity, very delicate uh, flavor to them. They are very, very uh, appealing on plates. They, you know, kind of plate well with many things because of the color the reds, the golds and yellows, they kind of pop on a plate. Um, and they really are, you know, something that is, is kind of, I would say the second most prized mushroom, probably after the morels. Um, and uh, this, the species that are in North America are really right now under uh, a lot of review because of the revelations that have been made uh, from the genetics. And the reason being is because uh, there's some species that were thought to be completely, you know, separate or no, completely identical, but they're actually separate once they started to look at it underneath the uh, DNA sequencing. Um, so there's just been these major revisions uh, in the genus more recently. I mean, even as recently as 2016. Uh, and uh, that is when Boyd published his seminal paper about the North American species uh, that are in Cantharellus. So uh, we'll go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into that in detail later. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So you can see here, this is the um, North American. Oh, no, you can click right click and go back. You can right click and go previous. Yeah. Previous. There we go. You're good. There. So this is kind of the phylogenetic map right here. Um, and you'll see that. There are several uh, species that are really closely grouped together. Um, and that's because a lot of them are very, very similar in appearance, uh, almost completely identical in appearance to each other. And you could not tell them apart unless you actually uh, put them under uh, this DNA analysis. So through these ITS uh, and LSU sequences, he, uh, Boyk and um, his uh, cohorts here have really kind of neatly mapped out the 29 different uh, species that have been described thus far. Now, this doesn't represent all of them. Uh, it's not completely exhaustive. Um, Tom Wolf estimates that there are 50 possibly in the United States, but uh, Boyk has more of a conservative estimate, something closer to like maybe 35 or 40, but there's still some work to be done here. Um, and a lot of that could possibly come out of finds from amateur mycologists like us, uh, people that are in places where these, you know, cryptic species complex have yet to be really uh, looked into deeply. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of opportunity here too for, you know, just kind of like personal discovery props, like say, you know, you're the first person to find Bubisii in your county, like that's something, right? You know, it's a, it's kind of like a, you know, just to yourself an accomplishment. Uh, if you kind of uh, look at it that way in terms of the opportunities for discovery that are there. And then also too, if you happen to come across uh, something and you know who's working with uh, Chanerelles, you can send them a dried sample to sequence, then you could also participate in possibly the discovery and the uh, elucidation of new species. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity there and there's a lot of really uh, interesting groupings of species and You'll see a lot of these are mentioned uh, in the uh, presentation because they do occur here. Many of these really don't. Some of them are more uh, Western species and some of them are more Far Eastern and North species. Uh, but enough of them do occur here that it, it makes Texas a very interesting place uh, taxonomically for the genus. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so in Texas, there's uh, a couple of, well, there's really three main habitat types that Chanerelles are going to be found in. Um, and I believe you can find two of them here in uh, North Texas in the DFW region. And then the other you're going to have to travel a little bit for. But the first is the uh, post oak savanna. Um, and uh, this uh, image here, this graphic came from the Texas Master Naturalist website. So you'll see this kind of uh, golden egg yolk colored swath here that extends from the Red River 
kind of through the eastern part down here into the central part of the state. That would be what you call the post oak uh, savanna. And in this uh, environment, it's really this yellow right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, it runs down extensively through this part of the state. And uh, it, it's also kind of spotily distributed through DFW. Uh, and really, uh, it's, it's a very interesting environment. It's almost completely dominated by uh, oak. There might be some smaller elms and ash interspersed, but this uh, really uh, almost xeric environment, this very dry, very sandy, loose topsoil uh, is ideal and perfect for chanterelles. Uh, and they're pretty much uh, occurring in symbiosis with these uh, oaks. Uh, post oak uh, is one of them. And then there's water oak, red oak, white oak also too that can be interspersed in there as well. Um, the uh, it's assumed generally that they're in these mycorrhizal relationships with these trees. Uh, really, there could be some exceptions to the rule when it comes to fungi. There's always exceptions to every rule, but for the most part, you've got to find these tree hosts to be able to locate chanterelles. Uh, and this post oak savanna hosts uh, the perfect environment for these post oaks and the small scrub that's underneath them. And uh, you, you will find the chanterelles typically where water is running through the environment, really not too far from a stream, creek bed, uh, washes where uh, water just comes through temporarily and goes into creeks. Those are good places to look. Um, also along trails, uh, disturbances in the soil and trails are really good spots to find chanterelles growing for whatever reason. Um, I'm not sure why there's uh, just maybe a zone or a boundary of nutrients that gets created when a trail or when a uh, cut gets dug. So chanterelles will actually grow out of these disturbances um, and they can be really obvious like a walking trail or a clear cut. Um, they can also be really subtle like a game trail like where deer um, or hogs go through. I um, mean, some areas where there's been, you know, hog rutting and the chanterelles are growing around where the hogs have rutted and disturbed the soil. So you really want to kind of focus on um, those aspects. What is this? I don't know. Ask my mom. Give me one. Uh, Blackland Prairie, I believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, Black, Blackland Prairie is kind of like our main bioeco region right here. And it is interspersed with these post oak yeah, savannas know. and also what are called cross timbers. And um, I, would assume that there are chanterelles found also in the cross timbers, but it's more likely to be in these post oak savanna type environments. Um, and there's a really good example of this in Arlington uh, in Crystal Canyon. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, kind of like uh, very xeric, like almost desert like. There's cacti around, there's really loose, rocky, sandy soil but there's all these post oaks and uh, underneath them, there's a huge diversity of not, not just chanterelles, but other, other fungi as well. So um, this represents one of the main habitats that I'll focus on when I look uh, in the DFW. There's also another um, good habitat uh, closer to um, Fairfield, Texas, down, I guess it's Fannin County, I'm not sure which county it is, but that's also a representation of this post oak savanna. And it's the same thing, you just look along the sandy soil where it meets uh, waterways, trails, disturbances, and those kind of areas. Um, Shut the door behind you, please. This is me. Uh, and Daniel Cunningham took this picture. This is kind of a, it, this is a transition zone between the post oak uh, environment and the hardwood bottom land. You can see there's oaks and there's some other species that are kind of interspersed there. Um, but if you'll notice, like, the chanterelles really pop against the uh, the ground, the environment. That's one of my favorite things about hunting chanterelles is that uh, unlike morels where I have to like sit there and like dig through stuff with a fine tooth comb, like you can spot them from really far away and uh, just kind of walk leisurely through the woods looking around and from like finding one from a distance, you usually find a cluster of them where they're growing uh, around their host trees together. And typically they're not solitary. They're usually uh, what's considered a gregarious um, distribution where there's a lot of them in a sim single area. And they can even be, some species can be seispatose. Some species can be semi seispatose kind of growing from a, a similar uh, base, not one base, but almost like they're growing from a similar base. So 
Um, it, once you find one, you there are good chances that you'll find a lot of chanterelles. So um, it's a really, uh, really good species to target if you're just looking for something to go out to do that's not super challenging. Like if you want to take kids uh, along and hunt them, it's really fun to take children because they can see them really easily. They pop out. Um, you know, there's they're not they're not really tough to find. Uh, they're actually quite common when you start finding the areas that they're in and you learn the metrics for targeting them. You, you see that they're almost uh, everywhere that these proper environments are. Uh, can we go to the next one? So um, hardwood bottom lands, that's another really important uh, habitat. Uh, here in uh, North Texas, we have the Trinity hardwood bottom lands. Those represent a really, really good um, habitat for chanterelles. Um, and the reason being is because the host species are there in, in aggregation. There's, you know, hickories, elms, oaks, ash, sycamores, uh, even sometimes, in, and when you go further south, there's some cypress mixed in there too. Um, and these like wet bottomland environments can even flood sometimes. And once the water recedes, it leaves the ground really saturated. Uh, and chanterelles love that kind of stuff. So I always uh, make a point too, if I'm in a post oak savanna type environment, sometimes there will be a transition where it goes lower towards the waterways and there's this hardwood bottom lands. I'll often check these type of areas too. And um, even in like um, Northeast Texas, this is kind of a really good environment to check um, for the, the red chanterelle species. Um, and there's really a lot of diversity in the chanterelles in these hardwood bottom lands because you have such a diversity of hosts. It's not just a, you know, a post oak uh, exclusive environment. You have really a lot of different types of trees. So that's where you start to find, you know, the smooth chanterelles, red chanterelles, um, and the associated species that are that are in these kind of environments. Uh, so I really I, I tend to focus heavily on areas that may flood, but they have to dry out. The ones that stay soggy constantly or wet constantly really don't produce as well. Uh, the chanterelles will be right up next to them, like kind of above them. You see how there's this dry line here. Uh, that's where I'll typically focus looking is kind of where the ground's a little bit raised, a little bit above the water but still in a place where it can flood and get wet from time to time. Um, and you, you'll see really a lot of these uh, hardwood bottomland environments too are kind of sparse on the, the bottom. There's not gonna be so much undergrowth. There'll be a lot of like dead, uh, deadfall leaves, detritus and things like that that make it really easy to see the chanterelles because they're super dark and moist and the chanterelles just pop against that environment. Um, so we'll go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Check, check this Zoom if I have any uh, chat. No, it's under meeting controls, huh? Yeah, it's, it's under meeting controls. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, I just minimized it for the. Does anybody have any questions? Is the door unlocked downstairs or are people locked outside? Oh, that's good. Uh, I should check. He should be sitting right there. Now. I think he <laughs> said he was laying in, right? Yeah, he should be. He was sitting right there. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was sitting there when we were trying to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, either, I, I, Go to slideshow. Yeah, uh, I gave her the one. Okay. See, click F5 slideshow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so yes and no. Uh, there's really limited uh, kind uh, attempts at cultivating cantharellus, uh, and that's because they're almost exclusively uh, in these ectomycorrhizal relationships with the host trees. Um, and so really, the attempts that have been made to cultivate them have been made using miniatures and uh, saplings of the host trees. So like any, something from genus, uh, the pinus, uh, pine trees have been used uh, to a very limited extent to kind of simulate an artificial culture, but it's not really reliable. Um, it takes many years for the networks to actually form into fruit. 
Um, and it, it really kind of, that is a kind of a frontier also in mycology is being able to cultivate these mycorrhizal species. Um, the book Radical Mycology actually has a section about attempting to cultivate chanterelles. So there's a good reference there. Um, but to my knowledge, it's not, not been successful on a level that people would say it's a commercial success, but it's been uh, successful in that people have made really small attempts and they they have grown them from saplings and seedlings, but it's not um, not as surefire as like say cultivating oysters or any other type of uh, saprobic mushroom. Like the guys trying to grow truffles. Yeah, it's like just like that. Um, they've had some limited success and actually even with truffles, they people have had some commercial success. Yeah. Um, I would say it's a little bit more advanced in truffles uh, than, than chanterelles right now. And obviously that's because truffles represent, you know, a greater return on investment. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some uh, very interesting opportunities there that people could try to experiment, uh, maybe working with slurries, uh, you know, tissue culture and, uh, you know, liquid cultures to try and inoculate young trees and then wait a few years. I wouldn't really know how to approach it. Um, I've never tried personally. Are there any other questions? What did you say the book was called? About? Radical Mycology. It's, is it Peter, Peter McCoy? Yeah, Peter McCoy. Peter McCoy, yeah. It's a really good one. I had a question you mentioned earlier, the identification, the genetic identification. How easy is it to get it, to get things analyzed? So it, it, it was really a lot of volunteer work that's being done um, for a person to actually uh, contract a lab to do it would be very expensive per sample. So a lot of it is done by amateur mycologists uh, like Alan Rockefeller and a few other individuals, but they're all swamped right now because so many people have been, you know, sending them samples. If you really wanted to, the best thing to do would be to find out, um, first of all, who is doing uh, work on the chanterelles in the region. And so that would be people like Boyk, uh, David P. Lewis, um, and there's one other individual, uh, Valencia Hofstetter, I don't know if I'm saying her name correctly, um, but all these individuals that are doing work on chanterelles, if you have something that you think is cryptic, you can contact them, you can send them an email, they all have academic emails, and see if they would be interested in, in taking the sample for uh, sequencing. Um, because right now, at, to do it as an individual, the, the cost would be really prohibitive. It would cost either, you know, a couple grand per sample to send it out to a lab, or, you know, the the other option is to try and do it yourself, which you would have to acquire, you know, PCR equipment and uh, something to actually match the sequences to the, the base pairs in the database, software, those kind of things. So um, it's possible that we as a group could eventually segue into that. Um, but we need donations first of uh, yeah, some yeah, really yeah. sophisticated equipment like uh, We've the already gel to look into or uh, PCR. Uh, maybe PCR for the Any PCR. It's about a thousand dollars. But it's yeah. not really the cost that's creeping us. It's actually um, the amount of knowledge that we lack in the sequencing and that nobody's here. To yeah, nobody's here. So we'll have to hey, that could be a great workshop. <laughs> to host, have somebody in, come in and do that. Uh, I had a Zoom meeting with uh, Stephen Russell, who does a lot of sequencing in Indiana. And I tried to get uh, as much information from him to try to start some sequencing of our own here. But it really takes like uh, about 10 hours of data analyzing <laughs> per sample. <laughs> And for us to do a class on that, it would kind of be a little bit. Like weird. I took a PCR it, class and literally took like almost a month. It, it would be more than just that. one time, a two hour class. Yeah, because you got to cover sample preparation, <laughs> yeah. how to separate and extract the DNA, yeah. how to actually read the sequences and match them to the, the database. Like all that is really complicated. Really I had originally thought about getting Alan to do a DNA sequencing. Uh, course for us, but I said, well, that's going to be kind of difficult. It would take a lot of time. People, they don't want to mess with microscopes, right? So, <laughs> you know, to get them to do DNA sequencing is a little bit different. So, hopefully, we'll change some minds this Halloween. Yeah. And do it.
doing as well as my prostitute workshop with this nice little fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he comes with all his all his cool gear. All right, so uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what type it is. He always changes up. I'll ask him. Yeah, uh, it up on the website. <laughs> So, so new scientists that build prototypes. Oh, no, oh, yeah. Cool. Well, I'll, so I'll I'll actually, my phone's recording. Uh, that as well. Do we have anybody else that has a question before we continue? No, yeah, uh, here with me. Actually. Yeah, we'll talk after. Oh, go Thank back. You. Right click. Sorry. There we go. Um, so this is the other uh, third major habitat type um, that, yep, yeah, on this map, it's the green shaded area goes back from, uh, I guess, um, I would say about Fannin County and, and all that down here, all the way down into Southeast Texas a little bit, and then over into the border with Louisiana. And actually it extends extends a little bit towards the coast too. Um, so there's, these zones are kind of interspersed and, and uh, they could be, you know, transitionary. Um, so this uh, habitat is primarily dominated by pine. Um, you'll see slash pine, loblolly pine, uh, those kind of trees. And uh, really, this environment uh, represents another very diverse uh, host uh, for chanterelles because often in between these uh, pines will be hardwoods interspersed too. Um, there will be bottomlands below the pines where it kind of closely meets the water, and then these two zones can kind of intermix. So this really represents, uh, in what my opinion, is the best chanterelle hunting in Texas. Um, commercial hunting uh, takes place out here in the National Forest, uh, the Crockett, Sabine, Angelina, uh, Sam Houston, um, and there's a lot of chanterelles that come out of there. So um, they don't have a problem with picking chanterelles on the if, stage. If you do personal amounts, mm -hmm. you, you can take, um, you know, a personal quantity from a national forest. I always ask permission first, but rangers typically say yes. Okay. If you do want to hunt commercially, you have to apply for a forest products permit. Okay. And that would be done at the individual ranger station in which you uh, okay. are hunting for that unit. So, 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 so out in the woods and you kind of, Big old patch. You know, I was always take a little bit of. <laughs> yeah, I just have a forest product permit. When, when, in which case, it's legal to pick and sell as many as you want. Let's break them well, those, are, those are really big national forests too. I mean, hundreds of thousands of acres. Down. You had a question? Yeah, I mean, uh, wouldn't state park rules be different? Oh, yeah. Okay, I national mean, forests are one thing. State, park state parks are completely off limits. You yeah. cannot pick chanterelles in state parks. It is illegal and it's a fine. They consider it a destruction of state park property, the natural resources, um, and it's actually classified as, as a plant. Uh, mushrooms are considered a plant to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and destroying it falls under the jurisdiction of removing plant life. So if you, you pick a mushroom in a state park, they can actually give you account for each individual mushroom that you pick there. Uh, if they really, if the officers really feeling like they can charge them separately for each count, so don't pick in state parks. Uh, there are a lot of state parks in that region too, but just try to avoid them. them. Yeah, well, the reason yeah. this is where the picture came from. Uh, and just as an example, I'm not saying go to Tyler State Park. Um, <laughs> don't. But uh, this is just um, you know a really good example of that kind of environment. And actually, um, you'll see too. This is kind of not really the perfect ideal in terms of pine habitat. I like, I like to look places that are a little bit more diverse. Um, you'll see plots like these that are clearly places where plantation pine has been planted, like where they're planting pine to log and where it's been logged recently. What I've noticed is the mycorrhizal species in these areas is slim to none. And that's because the woods just have not had time to develop the long-term associations and build those networks to provide a uh, body of uh, fungi that can support fruiting. So when I, I go to the piney woods, I look for big, really large um, old growth pines. And also I look for ones that are interspersed with different species of pine and different species of hardwood too, because uh, these exclusively pine monoculture uh, I guess forestry plots that are meant for uh, lumber, they really don't produce well. And in fact, to the point where if I drive into an area in a national forest and I see it's like that, I'll keep going or I'll find another place uh, on the map 
that looks a little bit more dense and a little bit more old growth where the distribution is a little bit better of these uh, host pines. So um, there's, there's really um, a lot of different species that occur down here. I would say you could probably find the majority if not all of them, with the exception of uh, the Corsophilus, because that specifically uh, associates with oaks, but a lot of the genus Cantharellus is in here. And if you really want to, um, you know, have a good haul, you want to take the time to go out to this area and uh, make a trip, you know, make it a weekend trip or a couple of days trip, spend it just walking around uh, mushroom hunting. One of the really I'll, I'll go ahead and, and give this spot away because it's huge, you know, it's a, a long, long area, but the Lone Star Trail has some excellent, excellent uh, places for chanterelle habitat and, and has some of the biggest flushes of chanterelles that I've ever seen. Um, so this, this region is really not to be overlooked. Um, it is a, our primary uh, cradle for a lot of our species diversity and uh, it keeps increasing the closer you kind of get to uh, what's called the Big Thicket National Preserve Area. That's where like the biodiversity of the species is really explosive, but uh, that's a protected place also. You can't pick there either. Um, so make sure that you're not picking on the big picket preserve. Um, any wilderness areas also, you can't pick in uh, wilderness areas. It's only national forests that you're, you're okay to pick in. I, yeah. I, I thought you could get the permit to go there. But... Wilderness areas are different from national forests. Uh, are, they, are they like the wildlife management areas no. or are those wilderness areas? No, they're areas? wilderness areas. Oh, I think okay. they're federal land and they're almost like the uh, protected preserves. Oh, cool. So yeah, you can't pick in those yeah. either. Wow. Um, but yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and, and go on here. To the, the what about one. wildlife management areas? Yes, you can pick in wildlife management areas. You have to have a pass to be in them. Uh, you have to purchase your, um, I believe it's like a tag that hunters get for land bucks. access, 10 bucks. But you also mm -hmm. want to check carefully, ask permission, ask the game warden. Yeah, um, I went to a few of those and I tried to look and ask for permission, but nobody was around. So was yeah, yeah, you yeah, should. Yeah, yeah, when you good. go to a WMA, you see yeah. sure there's nobody there. And yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, you got to ask the game warden. <laughs> that's, the, that's the number one authority I would think over the yeah, WMA. I would expect so. So, um, Army Corps of Engineer is, uh, I would say, is good because. I've never had uh, any Army Corps of Engineer personnel tell me that I couldn't pick. Um, I've asked them, I've asked their permission. They said, you know, pretty much it's considered the fair use of the public land there. So um, I would I would assume that if you are commercial picking though, there might be some kind of permit involved, like maybe a, a products use permit, but for personal picking, I'm pretty sure Army Corps of Engineer land is fair. So uh, let me ask you, when is the where is the threshold between personal and commercial right so, okay right? so <laughs> that is a really interesting question um in, in other states it's defined in the law um like oregon and washington they have these bucket laws you know where you're allotted you know a five gallon bucket a day or half a five gallon bucket a day or something like that um here there's really no distinction. So, I mean, me so personally, I can try, <laughs> try it out. <laughs> yeah, like me and my family, we can eat, you know, like 10 pounds of chanterelles. Like, that's like not really a whole lot, but to somebody else, you know, that's, oh, you know, you're trying to get rich. You're raping the woods. It's like, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of gray area there and relativity and perspective. So, I would just say use discretion. Um, <laughs> use your proper discretion wherever you are. Uh, don't get too greedy, uh, and always uh, ask permission if you're if you're not sure. Um, so the timing is really important. Um, uh, luckily for chanterelles, we have a really wide window, really long season for them. Uh, I have found them as early as late April, and I found them as late as uh, kind of the middle of November. So there's a really long window. Um, some people you know, especially in years where they're really abundant, they'll get tired of them. You know, somebody's wife is at home pissed off at her husband's like bringing back another basket of chanterelles to stuff in the fridge. Like they, there's just a long uh, drawn out season for them, but that's okay. Cause there's, you know, a lot you can do with them. There's a lot of different recipes and ways to uh, prepare them. So I like chanterelle season personally. I think it's great that we have such a, a long season here and it gives you something to do when uh, we actually have oh, rain. What's up? Like the rain you got now, that could be 
Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the rains came a little late, but you know, the, these significant rain events that we just had in DFW, some areas got three inches um, or more. That is really what it takes to trigger uh, chanterelle fruiting. Now in Texas specifically, we gotta watch out for drought. Um, I'll you know, always look and see if the area that I'm in or I'm targeting is gonna be in drought because chanterelles really do not fruit well during a drought. They will fruit really small and very, they'll dry out very quickly. So um, you definitely wanna make sure that you're not in a drought. Um, that is that kind of late spring uh, to summer to early fall season and you get a really significant rain event. Uh, these, these rains that are soaking downpours during the summer are really great for chanterelles. And uh, there's a little bit of a timing factor that's involved too with the rains. You don't wanna go, you know, while it's downpouring and raining, obviously the mushrooms are not just gonna pop up instantly. Um, and you definitely don't wanna go necessarily maybe the, the morning or the day after. But what I find from my personal experience is that waiting two to three days uh, minimum from these major downpours is kind of the sweet spot. Um, and then they'll fruit from those two to three days all the way through up to a week after that major event. And uh, the rule is kind of the more moisture and precipitation that happened during that event, the longer you're gonna have to wait before the chanterelles actually start appearing because the ground will get saturated and if it's too dry, they're, they're really not going, I mean, if it's too wet, too soaked, they're really not going to fruit until things kind of start to dry out a little bit. So uh, I usually uh, like, for instance, this week, we had uh, the major event was on, uh, what was it, Tuesday or Wednesday? It was Wednesday. Yes, yeah, so I, I didn't hunt on Thursday, but I went out Friday and I actually did find uh, some specimens. I'll, I'll share them at the end of the presentation over there. So. Yesterday, they were actually like kind of just starting to come up. And uh, there were a lot of areas with really small, like tiny primordia, the little pins that were coming up. So I definitely wasn't there at the peak of the fruiting from this rain. Um, and I expect it to be uh, pretty good for the next two to three days. So if you have some time, uh, definitely get out there and look. This is a really, really good rain event that we just had here that kind of kicked off our Chanterelle season for DFW. Uh, Dayton County, especially. And if I could touch on a point that he made uh, several times already. So the ground is very important, right? When you're yeah. walking on it and if it's cracked, if it's super dry, or anything like that, the, the trick is to make sure that there's a little bit of dew, which is like a little bit of moisture on the ground that you can still see. And that's a pretty good habitat. This last foray that we were on uh, in June, it was just very dry, cracked ground, and immediately I knew that we weren't gonna find a lot growing out of it, right? So and in cultivation, whenever we're soaking our grains, right, and you wanna get to the right, what's called field capacity. So I'm gonna use this term in, in the field as well, right? So field capacity is to have the right moisture content uh, in your grains after you soak and when you're about to sterilize, right? So when you think of that in terms of replicating in your environment, right? You want the environment to have similar, uh, similar uh, conditions, right? So it wants to be wet and you want to have a little bit of humidity. And that's really what starts off all this life that we find. Yeah, so there's definitely a, this sweet spot, this Goldilocks zone that he's talking about. Um, and yeah, you can generally judge whether or not an area is good based on, you know, feeling the ground with your feet. Is it really spongy, like super soaked? Yeah, you might want to move on to some place where it's a little more dry. Is it super cracked? Is, it, is there dust kicking up? Um, then you definitely want to go lower, more towards where the water's going, uh, wetter areas, because they're going to fruit in that sweet spot in that zone where the moisture has uh, has soaked but evaporated from the ground. So these uh, really, really big rain events, three to four inches, uh, big soaking rains, um, they can delay the fruiting a little bit longer, and uh, it can actually extend the fruiting too, like I said, about a week out from that rain event. So um, it's really a good time to check in that whole week. If you, if you can't get out in the first two to three days, you can go maybe three to four days out and still find uh, good, good hauls. And really it's kind of like, uh, it's good to check 
if you can every day. <laughs> I know it sounds like ridiculous, but if you have a spot in your house that you know they're fruiting at, you should check every day that you can after that rain event because there will be different areas that are fruiting coming up, different species that are going to be fruiting coming up at different times. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so the uh, obviously the rainfall being as important as it is, one of the most important tools that I'll use in terms of targeting chanterelles to go hunt them is the rainfall accumulation maps. Um, and uh, it's more of a short-term moisture. Uh, you'll it, you'll want to look for the 24 to 72 hour maps. Uh, the week maps are useful too, um, but the the main uh, accumulation that I focus on for chanterelles is this 24 to 72 hour map. Um, and what I'll do is I'll uh, go into uh, iweather.net's uh, rainfall totals. There are other similar maps that you can use, but I like this one a lot because it has the gradient over it um, and you can adjust the... Uh, what was it? iweather.net? iweather.net or iweather.com, sorry. iweather.com slash total rainfall map 24 hours. If you go to Google and type in Texas rainfall 72 hours, it'll pull this up, uh, this iWeather map. Um, and it has a, a toggle on it for 24, 48, and 72. I usually put it on 72. And then uh, I'll put the transparency on enough so that I can actually see the, the names of the cities, the towns. And uh, you can zoom in on it. And it's actually quite detailed to where you can even see like national forest boundaries. It's really good to see where it overlaps in those kind of prime areas because then you can say, okay, it, you know, it rained... Uh, four inches over here in Sabine National Forest, I know that, you know, in the next week in Sabine National Forest, there's probably going to be a lot of chanterelles. Um, so this, this map is really one of the most useful tools. Um, combining it with the drought maps also, I definitely uh, will we'll toggle a drought map first and make sure the area that I'm looking at isn't in a severe drought or moderate drought because that soaking rain will just go into the ground and then get absorbed by the trees really quickly and it won't do much for the mycorrhizal species. So uh, consulting a drought map followed by this rainfall map is kind of the primary process that I go through. Um, and uh, I have spots that are saved on um, Google Maps and also a uh, base map to where I'll, I'll basically just kind of go through and see, okay, what got the most rain? What is... Uh, the closest to me that's the most convenient to go look, you know, those kind of options that configure into uh, me forming a, a search. Oh, no questions? Cool. So, um, yeah, this, this. Sorry, I said that you can't answer it. So this is a map that shows the rainfall that we've had in the last 72 hours. This is not actually current. This is from a few weeks ago. This, um, yeah, we could pull up the current one. Yeah. Uh, we'll let you. It will. Uh, it might have done a hyperlink for that thing. Oh no! No, my images are dropping out. That sucks. Uh, it's probably because of memory from the Zoom meeting. Yeah, it's kind of messed up. We'll, we'll, we'll check it out. We'll check out the map after. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. The, uh, this isn't current, but you can go to the same website and look at the current map if you want to right now. And you'll see that, yeah, like the area around Dallas County, Denton County is like purple and red. So like there's been a lot of heavy accumulation. Um, and you can zoom in really closely too. Like you can see features such as like municipal parks, state parks, which you want to avoid, obviously, uh, the national forests uh, and kind of overlapping those features with the rainfall accumulation kind of helps you say, okay, you know, I've got a place to uh, formulate a search that I'm going to have a good chance of finding chanterelles. I've got, you know, national forests. Um, I've got uh, at least two inches of rain or more in a 72 hour accumulation. I'm not in a drought. If we've got all those three metrics, then um, it really looks enticing for me to want to actually go out and look. So another really good tool that I use, um, and uh, this is not an exclusive endorsement of Basemap. Uh, you could use other similar apps to it, but I like Basemap. Uh, Onyx is another similar one, and I think there's a third. Um, 
can't remember the name of it. That's really good. But anyways, these are custom uh, map programs that allow you to, this app allows you to basically uh, use satellite imagery to uh, overlay different uh, features onto specific maps. Like uh, there's not a lot of layers triggered on this one right now for clarity, but it's got the actual uh, trails in here that are marked, waterways that are marked. Um, there's a really cool feature in base maps that has a private land owner boundaries, which is really key when you're in national forests. You want to make sure that you're not trespassing on the private land. Um, so I highly recommend getting Onyx base maps or uh, one of these similar apps so that you can uh, map out your search, um, kind of go and look and see, you know, from the satellite imagery perspective, uh, what, what really looks good to me uh, is this area right in here. Um, because of these three features, we've got what looks to be a power break or a fire break right here that's cut through that goes to this trail. Um, and this, uh, these cuts kind of like really uh, have a lot of uh, opportunities for Shanner also to come out because of the disturbed soil. The trail also um, is really good too. You'll see them often sometimes just coming right out of the trail. Uh, there's a really dense wooded area up here where it looks like it kind of the land dips down a little bit more. You would be able to apply a topographic layer to actually see the, the different changes in the topography. Um, and there's a, a water source, this uh, clear creek that runs through here. A lot of times there will be really small uh, tributaries that run into these water sources and along these ravines and tributaries is really good uh, chanterelle access. So I generally try to um, keep, uh, you know, in mind that, okay, there's water source nearby, there's disturbed ground nearby, and there's easy access to a trail um, because trails make it really easy to navigate in these national forests. I don't know if you've ever been out to Lone Star Trail uh, in the Sam Houston, this area, but it is, it's like a jungle in some places. It's like super thick. So bushwhacking it through is not really the best way to cover ground, um, but uh, you really will find a lot of chanterelles off trail. So it's good to have that main trail for access here. Um, and this is, this is actually a really good place to start uh, looking on the Lone Star Trail. This is trailhead number 11 here, just south of Cold Spring, Texas. Um, so base map, really important. I definitely uh, recommend getting either it or Onyx. It's a really cheap subscription monthly, um, but the utility of it is just, um, I, it, I really use this a lot when I'm out looking. One of the best features about it too is that you can actually save maps that you find. So you can uh, download the map, even with all the features generated on it and save it for offline use. So when you actually go out in the national forest and your cell service drops out, you've still got the map uh, actually pinged on your, uh, your phone. And even sometimes too, you'll have enough, just a barely enough signal that it can bring up the GPS. So you can actually see where you are in relation to the map. Um, but this is a really, really good tool for targeting uh, chanterelles. Are there any questions before you move on? Uh, it's, it's probably CPU issues from the Zoom thing. I'm having images drop out. I apologize. Um, it's the CPU thing. If but later on, I can go back and refer to some of the ones at the end of the presentation if they're not, you know, presented here. So um, what we have here is uh, this is what is the kind of the identifying feature of most of the cantharellas that you'll find in Texas is that they uh, do not have what are called lamellae or true gills. Um, they have these uh, kind of lamellar folds and they're like ridges. They they go along the, um, the bottom side of the, the pileus and they kind of like extend to the, um, the stipe a little bit. Some of them are actually decurrent too, um, but for the majority of them, you'll see that they don't have this very sharp uh, edge and they don't stick out. They're very blunted, rounded, and some of them are actually intervened. You'll see like, uh, instead of just running the you know, parallel, there will be some that are perpendicular uh, and some species, the, the inner veined uh, ways, the, the lamellar folds interconnect is very prominent, almost like uh, they're like, like, like blood vessels. So uh, that's a really key identifying feature for them. A lot of people get confused because there are some that are very similar, 
but as you can see over here, the sharp bladed edge um, indicates that it is not a, a lamellar fold. These are actually true lamellae, and this is a true gilled uh, mushroom. So um, definitely something to be aware of when you're out looking for chanterelles is that you always want to make sure that you have what are called quote unquote false gills, these lamellar folds. Um, these are what make up one of the key identifying features of cantharellus. So um, this, this is kind of what will break down the, uh, you know, the major distinction uh, for a lot of the chanterelles. There's some that are smooth and that don't have uh, as prominent lamellar folds, but they're still there. When you look at them really closely, you can see them even though they're very uh, subdued. So that, that is uh, what you want to especially focus on this underside of the cap uh, where there's these lamellar folds is going to be one of the key identifying features. Um, so go ahead and go to the next one. Ah, uh, my image dropped out. So this one is really, really uh, one of the main ones that trips a lot of people up. I see on identification groups, uh, a lot of people mistake this mushroom for chanterelles. It is not a chanterelle. Uh, this is a, uh, Umphalotus subiludens, which did they move subiludens to just eludens now? Or? No, it's a different species. Okay. Yeah, so we, we get them often in Texas, uh, kind of in the transition to chanterelle season, early spring uh, or even in the middle fall. We will get these fruiting at the same time that chanterelles do. You don't want to eat them, they are toxic. Um, they are really a, uh, they're not a good uh, mushroom to ingest. So I try to make sure to avoid them by looking underneath the cap, seeing is there, you know, that lamellar fold versus the true lamellae. You can see that how rich they are and how sharp they are. Those are definitely true gills, true lamellae. And um, you can even see too that the growth is like truly sesbatose. They're not, you know, growing like clumped together. They are actually from one base. So that's another key identifying feature. Um, I had a picture on here of hygrophoroides, uh, Cantharellus, because that one looks really close to chanterelles, but uh, I don't know, the image dropped out. We'll have to look at it at the end of the presentation. Okay, so uh, color is really important. Um, in a lot of these descriptions in the literature, they'll have uh, a lot of, you know, really precise, really specific colors like uh, amber, ochre, orange, butter, yellow, butter, brown, like there's really this whole spectrum of, of really specific color descriptions that go in describing chanterelles. So um, you definitely want to make sure that you have, number one, a picture of it in natural lighting. That's the most important thing. You don't want to use artificial lighting. Don't wait till you take it inside. Get the picture of the mushroom while it's in the field uh, and use that natural lighting to try and get the most true representation of what the color is. And don't wait to uh, do this, do this immediately after picking it um, because those colors, uh, they change over time while it's in your basket till you know, all the way till you get home. There's changes that take place that can kind of obscure the true color of the, uh, the chanterelle. And so I had a cantharellus lucia and that was over here, yeah. the red one. It probably um, has a russula at first. <laughs> no, and, and uh, this one is a really, really unique. You can see here, uh, I want you to look at the inside of the margins there. There's a, there's a green, an olive in there. And that's, um, this is um, Cantharellus uh, Tavaridisans. I can't pronounce the name correctly, but it's that's the Viridis, the green is in there from the Latin nomenclature because it has this green color. So that's one of the identifying features is the, the green uh, in this one and in others, you'll see, you know, more of like a, what's more common is yellow, uh, egg yolk yellow has been the description of many, uh, butter yellow uh, has been uh, another one. Um, have you found this one? No, I have not. Uh, no, and, and it, it, it is, it has actually only been observed uh, once in Texas. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what I was so, thinking. Yeah, this is, this one represents, uh, you know, another one of those frontiers, like kind of like there's not a lot of observations. Um, you could be the first to make it in a particular county. Um, and it's really something that is kind of rare and unique. Uh, they are, they're definitely distributed across the Gulf Coast. So 
uh, well, there's a specific section where I'll get more into, into this specific species, but the color is really important, uh, emphasizing like these natural lightings and natural uh, um, scenarios for the color. And then also too, the underside of the cap color is really important. Um, that transition from the cap to the stem, uh, the, even the in-between the veins, that color, it can change over time as the mushroom matures. So it's really important to pay attention to these really kind of minute uh, macro features uh, when you're looking to identify chanterelles. Uh, the, the color is, is definitely one of the most important things. And actually it's, it's funny because in mycology traditionally, a lot of mushrooms are really, uh, they're kind of nitty gritty of them is distinguished through microscopy, but chanterelles kind of all look really similar uh, and microscopically. And some of the features are actually almost impossible to distinguish, uh, in, especially spores. So the macroscopic features surprisingly actually represent uh, what are the main components that people use to, to key them. Um, and then beyond that, once you get to a certain point where you, know, you have something that's macroscopically identical, you can't do anything from there, but get the DNA sequencing to tell them apart. Um, but color is, is definitely one of the most important uh, features. And if you're trying to key them, identify them, always make sure to have the best representation of the natural color. And then observing to the bruising where you handle it, uh, some of them will bruise and change color where you handle them. Um, and apparently too, I didn't know this until very recently, but there's a reagent that people use uh, to drop on chanterelles and it's uh, iron salts. Uh, I thought it might have said No, uh, iron sulfate. Uh, so uh, yeah, Michael Quo um, actually has some really good images of the uh, reaction from um, iron sulfate with uh, different chanterelle tissues. And in some of them, what it does is iron sulfate will create a red reaction. And uh, in many of them, the majority of them, it won't. So that's why it's used as a, uh, an identifying reagent. But uh, it's not, not really as common as say like someone using potassium hydroxide for, for bolides. Um, it's, it's more of a, a novel thing, but it, it's one way to actually help differentiate from some of the more cryptic species. Um, can we go to the next slide here? Yeah. Also, does all chanterelle have the scent like apricots? No. Um, all chanterelles do not have a scent like apricots. Um, some of them actually don't smell very much at all. Uh, one of the really uh, key identifying features of uh, a lot of the chanterelles is the fact that, you know, they have that odor. So some of those species that do have a stronger odor like apricot, you know for sure that you've got a chanterelle in that complex. Um, Craterellus odoratus, it was formerly in chanterelles, but got moved to Craterellus. Um, that's a big one that has a really prominent uh, smell from the, uh, the aromatic molecules. I think some of them are carotenoids too. There's carotenoids in some of them. So smell is not really necessarily like the biggest uh, factor, I would say. It's, it's more of like, um, there, it is key to some species, but the, not all chanterelles are going to smell like apricots. Um, but when you do smell them, it's, it's actually pretty remarkable. I, I think all of them do have like a stringy white interior though, right? Similar yeah, to that's like, one thing that you can, like, like, yeah, like that string, flesh. Like a string cheese, right? So when you break them open on the inside, you kind of just peel it like string cheese. Yeah, that's that's one that's more and universal. It's a white interior, so you got the but, uh, usually exterior, and then it's like the white interior. Yeah, the gradient between the interior color is very universal in chanterelles, but the the smell is definitely not. Um, so don't be discouraged if you find chanterelles and they don't smell. Yeah. It just might be that that species doesn't smell. But uh, and, if you do, and a lot of people they don't really recognize odor that well, right? Because I tried to explain like another genus, like Agaricus, right? And the odor in that one's very important, but some people aren't really able to recognize even unpleasant odors. Uh, yeah, it's, it's unpleasant very, odors. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gray area. I know what odor. <laughs> I know what odor he's talking about too. Um, but DNA molecules. Um, on display here, it's basically, this is the frontiers of, uh, of the taxonomy in the field is, is uncovering, unraveling the, uh, you know, microscopic, I'm sorry, molecular uh, analysis of these uh, species. And uh, generally you'll see a lot of uh, tech, modern techniques being involved like, um, uh, you know, PCR, 
and uh, gel electrophoresis. Uh, I think I said that correctly, I don't know. But um, those, uh, those techniques are where you use to unravel the ICS and LSU sequences of the chanterelles to distinguish them as a particular species. Um, and it's, it, it's really kind of, uh, at some point, there, there are some that are so identical to each other that you really do have to. Um, and I'll, there are some specifically that I'm gonna get into here later on the, the presentation. But um, if you come across that roadblock, there are, like I said, a lot of ways to try and, and go about it as an amateur. You can contact an expert who's doing work in that field. You can contact uh, maybe one of the people on Mushroom Observer uh, that are actually doing work in sequencing North American mushrooms, uh, because there's a lot of people out there that are doing volunteer work and devoting their time to, um, you know, just advancing discovery to, you know, because these, these are important things. Uh, it's important to map and catalog these species and their ranges, um, for one, because some of them, we don't even know they exist yet. We need to describe and uncover them. Uh, two is because some of them may actually be endangered or threatened. Uh, and their environment might actually be imperiled. So it's good data to be able to generate to know so that we can actually maybe try and uh, catalog and perhaps even save the environments that are at risk for some of these threatened species. Um, so the, the taxonomic work that's being done right now, in like the next, uh, I would say, five years is definitely going to uncover a few more species. Uh, I would say uh, the, the experts uh, all are saying that there's, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 more species left to be uncovered in, in North America. So uh, that definitely represents what uh, I think is a frontier in mycology um, and not just for the experts, but for amateurs, people that, you know, go and that log their finds on Mushroom Observer or iNaturalist. Um, if you haven't joined our project already on iNaturalist, please do so. Uh, you can find it under our same name. And then even to um, submitting samples to fungariums or herbariums is another way that you could uh, kind of passively participate in the process because some of those specimens that are stored in these places do eventually get picked up and analyzed um, for their um, you know, molecular phylogeny. So what you need to do is to prepare a sample for uh, analysis, you need to make sure to take it, uh, get it out of light, UV light as quickly as possible, and dry it, um, preferably with low heat uh, or no heat. Um, but uh, the removal of light and oxygen as quickly as possible is really important to preserve uh, the integrity of the, the DNA. Uh, light is a big one. So if you could store it in you know, a dark jar or a dark ampule and then send it to wherever it's going, um, that's a really good way to preserve the sample. Uh, for genetic analysis. Um, do we have any questions for the next slide? Okay. Do you have any favorite ones locally? You guys like to compare them to the places? But um, there was a new one that was recently started at UT Austin. I think. Yeah. And is that correct? Yeah. yeah. They have a, a fungarium that at UT Austin that I sent a box of samples down so they can kind of put it in there. Yeah, and actually, I, I would like to start submitting some samples to the fungarium there. I mean, admittedly, myself, like I have not been the best about cataloging or recording or uh, sending on samples of chanterelles. I usually eat them. Uh, so uh, it's really kind of, uh, you know, like, okay, I've, I've been doing this for a long enough time now that I need to put my big boy britches on and, and you know, contribute something. So um, I'm taking it upon myself this year to make some uh, deposits and since the, you know, from the area of UT Austin yeah, started. And, and that'd be really good you know, if you do find that. something cool, uh, please always take a picture of it. Even if you don't know what it is, right? If you might not think it's cool, we, we will. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the thing is, we'd like to, uh, I have about 250 species uh, that I own in my own personal fungarium that I'd like to donate to the club one day when we figure out spacing, right? So even these uh, species that I've been adding to this fungarium, I'd like to collect everybody else's if they find some rare sighting, you know, and then if they wouldn't mind drying it out. <laughs> and I mean, not, not, it's not necessarily always rare or what looks rare too. I mean, some things that look quite common actually turn out to be cryptic species. Mm -hmm. Like uh, there's there was some work that was being done in Michigan where people had seen three, what they thought were uh, Cantharellas ten, ten weethrix, and they were all growing within like 30 feet of each other. They sequenced all three mushrooms. They were three different uh, species. So it's basically, you know, uh, 
any really any chanterelle that you find it even if you can't you know key it completely it represents the potential to be you know a possibly a cryptic undescribed species uh, but more more likely than not it's probably described but here in texas i would say because of the diversity and because of the you know unique habitats and environments the odds are really high that you might have something that's in a species complex um, so it's always good to at least ask an expert or get in touch with someone, maybe post your, your find on mushroomobserver.org or iNaturalist uh, and get those uh, expert keys in there. So these are the, uh, well, this is what's represented by the red uh, cantharellus, the red taxa part of the genus. And uh, there are two main species that represent it here in Texas, and they're identical. Um, they're called Cantharellus cinnabarinus and Cantharellus texensis. And the only way really to tell them apart is with molecular phylogeny. Um, some people say that the cinnabarinus are a little bit more large uh, and stocky and meaty, but the, the line there is really so blurred that to actually be able to tell with any definity or with any certainty, you have to do sequencing. So, um, you know, we do have uh, a lot of uh, the red chanterelles in East Texas. They're, they're primarily associated with pine uh, and in these like uh, pine hardwood floodplains uh, and also these, uh, you know, kind of diverse pine old growth forests. So they, they definitely are really easy to see. They stand out with that bright red, uh, ruddy color. It's not like an off red either. It's like a really like almost fluorescent tone so um, they're really easy to find. And when you find one, you find, typically find quite a few of them. They tend to have this really gregarious uh, distribution in their habitat. Um, and they, they don't really smell uh, as much. Um, they do have a really unique taste. It's to me, it's kind of like a peppery uh, flavor. It's very, um, I would say they're a little bit more flavorful than most of the big yellow chanterelles of other species that I find. Um, the Cinnabarinus and the Texensis, uh, that, that complex is, is really actually uh, very prized by chefs because of the color. You can plate them and, and make a plate really pop with that red color. Have you Those made jerky? Are... Jerky? For actually, no, I haven't. Um, that's one thing I have not paraded yeah, to. Yeah, that would be really good. Those are primarily associated with pine. Yeah. Right? You don't find them with hardwoods? I typically don't, but I have found them in... Uh, in Fair, not Fairfield County, um, Bannon County, oh, okay. in an area where pines were kind of encroaching onto uh, hardwood. Mm -hmm. So um, it, there definitely has to be pine present. I haven't found them without pine in my personal experience. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if they make an exclusive micrological, I'm sorry, mycorrhizal relationship with uh, members of genus Pinus. So so east, um, texas. east texas yeah east texas yeah. Um, but actually i have i have that i have found uh red taxa within uh an hour and a half of the fw so not that far east okay let's go to the next one okay this is uh cantharellus tabernensis um, it's uh really really common um these are what represents almost the bulk of the a commercial uh, chanterelle harvesting picks across the Gulf Coast in Southeast Texas. Uh, they're very, very widely distributed. Uh, they can be in pine, but they can also be in hardwood bottomlands. I've seen them in hardwood bottomland floodplains. Um, and I've also seen them in the areas where those two habitats interface. So what you would really wanna look for in them is they're gonna have that kind of smaller, more skinny stipe. Um, it's not gonna be as thick as some of the other yellow chanterelles, um, they maintain this golden, like, kind of, uh, I would say, butter yellow. Um, you, does anybody eat Kerrygold butter? I like Kerrygold, that Irish butter. It's like that color. So um, they, they maintain that color from the, uh, below the hymenium the, and the, um, I'm not the hymenium, the uh, pileus all the way down this diet. So that's one identifying feature. They will have a little bit of brown, and that brown will typically be concentrated in the center, in the middle of the cap. But one thing I want you to pay attention to is notice the stipe. Um, it is not brown. So uh, that really is what makes up kind of the very strong identifying features of uh, Tabernensis. It's almost cratered, huh? Yeah, they will. No, they will be. They'll typically be cratered. The margin will be inrolled. Um, and another thing I noticed about these is, is that the, the cap margin is almost never perfectly round. 
it's mm -hmm. almost always kind of like um, a little wavy, a little bit enrolled, and uh, the stem and the stipe too doesn't seem to really uh, have much bruising, if any at all. And uh, it doesn't have a white stipe unless you expose the inner flesh like this one over here. And it does not have a brown stipe, which is really important. And uh, I'll explain why in, in another slide. And that one's more of a pine, I'm guessing, by the debris. Yeah, the debris is pine. But like I said, I have found this one in hardwood bottomlands. This one, this one really is not picky. Um, it, it's it's uh, very common and very widely distributed. Okay, here's um, another one. Um, this, this is one that's common around here. Yes, this one is common around here, but uh, it does represent a kind of a, a complex. Uh, there are some species that seem to be cryptic within uh, Tenuithrix group, um, and it is not necessarily, you know, uh, definitively uh, identifiable chanterelle. You, you definitely, uh, you can get close enough to say that it's suspected Tenuithrix, but at this time there still needs to be a little bit of work done. Um, and what you'll notice here is uh, now on the older specimens, it's you'll see that they are yellow, butter yellow on the top. Margin is enrolled, um, but they're also butter yellow uh, on on the underside too, and that's very important. You'll see that the white here kind of stops at the underside of the the uh, pileus here. So that white is going to be kind of the identifying feature because it it has a zone. It stops below that. Uh, part of the enrolled cap. And this is what I suspect that the chanterelles I found this week were. Um, you want to pass yeah. something around. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I'm not totally sure because of one factor and that's they're really, really light on the, the bottom, the ones that I found. So they kind of make me think that originally they might've been uh, some, somewhat closer to what's called uh, Cantharellus phasmatis. But uh, phasmatis is, is different from Trinethrix because it, it has white all the way up the, uh, the underside of the cap on the hymenium. So instead of just being that zone where it transitions from uh, yellow to white, it would be white all the way up. And it would also have a much wider uh, base. Uh, that's one thing to, to kind of pay attention to um, is the ratio of this uh, cap diameter to the length of the, of the uh, stem. So that, that stipe is really going to be a little bit elongated on Tenuthrix. It's not going to be as stocky and as short and as thick as um, C. phasmatis. So um, this one is also oaks. I found this in post oak savanna. Um, I've also found it in hardwood bottomlands too. I do not suspect that they, um, you know, don't like pine. Uh, there's some pine needles in this picture right here. Um, but I tend to typically find the um, the more common, um, not to nutrix. Phasmatis. Fa not phasmatis is the one before. Super common. The, the Savarius got broken up into three, right? Yeah, it got broken up into those. But these these typically are are something I'll find in North Texas. Um, in the post oak savannas um, and in East Texas, they're a little bit more limited. I don't really see them as much in, in exclusively pine areas. Um, so I wouldn't assume that they're not there, but I just don't see them as often. Um, let me go to the next one. You see many lookalikes? Um, lookalikes, typically, no. Um, I mean, to a person that has kind of picked up and looked at a few chanterelles, you start to kind of really get used to the distinguishing features. Um, but there are lookalikes out there to people that may not necessarily have as much experience. Like to me, Hygrophorodes, the, the Canterelle does not look like a Chanterelle to somebody that hasn't ever seen them before. It could definitely look like a Chanterelle. Uh, Jack-o'-lanterns definitely look like Chanterelles to people. And I mean, uh, who is the Horse Whisperer? Who's that guy? Yeah, there was some famous uh, or semi-famous TV star celebrity I guy that, that I thought that was a common name for my <laughs> no uh, he, uh, he, ended up feeding, he ended up feeding his family um, chanterelles or no what he thought were chanterelles and they were uh, jack o' lanterns and he ended up poisoning like his whole family basically <laughs> so have much bigger gills right they have true gills right. they have true lamella they don't have these uh, um, lamellar folds like this they actually have sharp uh, 
and their gills are a little decurrent too. They kind of semi go down the, the stipe, but they also uh, have a less buttery yellow color and they're more like, I would say amber orange. They're more that deep pumpkin, like ripe pumpkin orange. When, when you break them open, they're, they're not entirely white. Yeah, I mean, it seems kind of obvious when, if, you can, if you have good vision, I guess. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to some people, things are obvious, to others are more like, you know. <laughs> it does take a trained eye. It really does take some getting used to um, and looking for those details uh, that are not really apparent to people because most people, mushrooms, like that's a mushroom. Oh, that looks like a mushroom too. It's an orange mushroom. Oh, here's an orange mushroom, you know, but it's like they, they definitely need to make some uh, distinguished uh, observations if you're going to ever get to, uh, you know, eating wild mushrooms because yeah, it's not really good to go out there and make assumptions. It's, it's the I haven't used iNaturals for mushrooms. They're pretty good. Yeah. iNaturals is good. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, project. It's really good for making observations. Also, it's really good as kind of like a cheat code to find chanterelles because if you look on iNaturalist and <laughs> you search the species on the map, there are log observations posted. So uh, if you search, you know, Cantharellus and uh, spots. on the map on Dallas, you'll see, you know, there are spots all over. And I actually have used our naturalist to find new Chanderell spots. And get them. That oh, nice. <laughs> Damn. Damn. That's crazy. See, I've always wondered that about morels. I'm like, man, are people really putting morels on? Or is this, you know, is this psychological warfare? Yeah, like, yeah, put a morel like right in front of a police station or something. You know, like yeah, it's like I can see how people could do that, but no, that's great. Yeah, use I natural. It's a great tool. Um, so this one is a Cantharella spasmatis. Uh, it is a kind of common, but not really that common. It's widely distributed, I would say. It's very similar to this other one. It is. And I'm going to tell you how to distinguish them here in a moment. Um, they don't glow in the dark like a jacket. No, no. These do not glow in the dark. Um, they, uh, they have a very distinct butter yellow, rich yellow, not, not orange brown uh, cap. Um, and what I want you to look at here, the distinguishing feature is the white on Cantharella spasmatis goes all the way up the stipe into the uh, underside of the pileus. So you'll see that there's not a, a zone of transition. It can, it's continuous. And also even sometimes in the top, in the tops of C. phasmatis, as they mature, you'll see white kind of show itself in some of that uh, cap. And that's, that's one of the distinguishing features. I put quotes here because unfortunately, this is not one of the ones that you will be able to uh, identify uh, down to species without uh, molecular analysis because there is a cryptic species complex here. There's a chanterelle called uh, Cantharellus deceptivans. Um, and you can imagine how it got that name because it, it's deceptive. It, it looks exactly like Cantharella spasmatis. So um, if you have the spasmatis complex, feel free to send it to somebody that's doing work and uh, maybe they'll sequence it for you to determine whether you have spasmatis or maybe you might be the first person to uh, observe Cantharella deceptivans in Texas because as far as I know, that hasn't been done yet. Uh, so that's spasmatis uh, oak. Oak um, post. I have found these in post oak savanna. Um, I I'm gonna assume that they also occur in hardwood bottomlands, but um, I don't know for sure. I do know for sure that the one observation that I personally have made of this has been in a post oak um, savanna, a very popular canyon in uh, Arlington. Um, so. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the, the next slide. So this one and this one here are both kind of associated with oak, and they're both very similar looking. And I wonder if that's uh, on purpose, or <laughs> mm. you know, because I never really thought about this until now. You know, because the, the previous ones are uh, kind of associated with pine, and these are were in a species complex, like Patrick mentioned. And you're recently broken up from one called Sibarius. Uh, yeah, Sibarius used to be kind of the catch-all, like, um, I mean, for for decades, I mean, even almost a century, like, that was what was applied to most yellow chanterelles. Um, can you, can you go, well, yeah, so after they started doing the, uh, you know, phylogeny, phylogenetic analysis, they're like, look, this is not an appropriate uh, synonym for any North American species. And in fact, now, uh, Cibarius is exclusively European only. 
so none of the if somebody says you know Cibari select or Cibari group uh, in 2022, that's not acceptable. Tell them you got to do better than that. I have a question. Uh, so since Shenfelds don't really have like true guilds, um, are the spores like developed the same and dispersed the same? They are similarly, okay? So they're distributed across the entirety of the surface. Um, the hymenophores are actually distributed across those, those bumps and those ridges. So um, I'm not sure that it's exactly like a gilled mushroom, but I know that it serves a, the same purpose. Uh, so the spores are coming, there's basidiocarps, right? Are coming from the lamellar folds um, or the basidio. What, not acetylcarp is the actual mushroom, right? What is the name of the spore producing thing? Uh, hymenophore. Hymenophore, but what's the name of the spore producing thing that's on the hymenophore? Basidia. Basidia, yeah, the basidia. Okay, um, so this one, uh, I want you to look at it and see just how closely it looks to the- uh, the, That first one. Yeah, the first one. Can I go back to it? Or? Yeah, go back. Yeah, so it's very similar to Tabernanzis, um, and it, I don't believe it has been observed officially in Texas, but the species complex is so close that it may actually uh, be observed here soon. And the distinguishing feature, um, well, actually, Alexei Sergeyev uh, observed this in Texas, so I guess it has been, but it's not really technically, you know, official. Um, so it's right here, you'll see, the brown in the center of the cap, it's kind of that butter brown, like butter after it's been sauteed. And then you've got brown on the stipe. That's really one of the most important distinguishing features uh, between the two. Um, this one also could probably go in for um, some genetic analysis because it may represent a species complex. And there's uh, that sandy soil you were mentioning. Yeah, the sandy <laughs> soil, you can see how loose and how uh, kind of poor that soil is. Uh, and you can see some pine needles there. This is almost exclusively uh, distributed in the bottom of <coughs> hardwoods where pines are in a mix. Um, and the Appalachian uh, Mountains is where a lot, the majority of these observations are made. Uh, Michael Kuo will see them a lot in his state. I think we believe he lives in New York. So all along the Eastern seaboard in, in the Appalachian Mountains is where they commonly occur. But the uh, extant range of this species does extend into Texas. Um, and it may represent to some taxonomical anomalies that are here in Texas being so far at the edge of its range. Uh, and it's typically really small, just like the, uh, the Tabernensis, very small, the skinny stipe, um, but not so small that um, it wouldn't be noteworthy. You can see kind of the comparison here between the leaf litter and the size of uh, these fruit bodies. Um, not to be confused with uh, Cantharellus minor, because it is gonna have that brown both in the, in the cap and in the stem. Uh, so do we have any questions? Next slide. Sweet, cool. Oh. <laughs> Cantharellus confluence, it's gone. Um, yeah, they're really hard to see. So I guess, I guess what's happening is, is the uh, memory is dropping out of the, the laptop because I'm streaming Zoom and trying to do this presentation. So what I'll do is really quickly here. Let's see if we can get the oh. Oh. Okay. That one's a pretty one. Yeah, it is. It's a difficult name. They all look the same to me, except for the color. So confluence, here we go. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, you can different. see this one uh, is, uh, we're getting into here what are called the smooth chanterelles. So um, this one has a smooth underpour and a surface, uh, but the really defining feature of confluence is that it splits from a single uh, base. So uh, there's one that's really close to this called um, Cantharellus lateritius which is the classic smooth chanterelle um, and craterellus uh, odoratus, which was moved from cantharellus because uh, it has also has a smooth surface, but this one is really distinguished by the uh, multiple kind of split caps that come off the same base. 
So if you find a smooth chanterelle that looks like it's mutated, the, the first time I found this, I found it in Fannin County. Um, and I thought I was looking at, you know, something that had been contaminated possibly, or, you know, maybe mutated somehow. But uh, as it turns out, that's the actual growth pattern of it. It splits off and forms these really kind of weird uh, double caps from, from a singular stem. Um, and it'll even split in the middle uh, to where it looks very strange, almost like, um, I don't know if you ever cultivated oysters and seen like some of the mutant oysters that you get. Uh, it looks very similar to that. Um, and these, uh, other than the, uh, you know, smooth um, kind of surface on the underside of the peleus, the identifying feature is that split from the singular base. So I'll see if I can uh, try and get back here a little bit. What's your theory on uh, why these lack prominent ridges? I, I think it's just the way that uh, their evolutionary biology took them that particular, you know, species complex, the smooth ones. Maybe they found it more advantageous to distribute the, uh, you know, the lamellae across a flat surface instead of the ridge surface uh, for, whatever, for whatever reason, I don't know. Maybe it's because they possibly don't reproduce very well by spores. Mm -hmm. Um, and they don't necessarily have to have that increased surface area of like the outward poking landward folds, but I have no idea. I'm, I'm just I, guessing I, that. I almost wonder if they're transitioning to completely getting rid of them. Mm. No, maybe, <laughs> yeah, like you, it might be advantageous for it to happen like smaller. Maybe or, in like 10,000 or 20,000 years or however. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, or maybe, you know, it's uh, it's not particularly adept at reproducing necessarily by spores. Maybe a lot of this mushroom gets spread through, you know, the mycelium being distributed, oh. washing around, things like that. Um, I don't, I really don't know, don't know why. I would like to look more into that and find out why they, yeah. the smooth chanterelles ended up the way that they did. Yeah. Um, maybe that's a question uh, for David Lewis. Yeah, I'd like to ask. And they never hybridize, do they? Um, as far as I know, they don't. But uh, I mean, this is, the smooth chanterelles represent uh, kind of a difficult, um, difficult keying, and I'll, I'll explain why when we go to the, the next slide. Um, yeah, let me pick it up here. Well, let's let's look at this one first. So this is. Um, even Tate Breeze. Um, and this one, like I said, has only been observed once uh, in Southeast Texas. Uh, and it has been served a few times on the Gulf Coast and Louisiana. And the really, really distinguishing feature is that green color along the enrolled margin there. Uh, that's another thing. The margin's almost always enrolled on these. Uh, they have this kind of like, you know, butter yellow underside of the surface that can kind of pale a little bit as it ages. Um, but that green color That's will, where comes yeah, from, yeah. is where it comes from in the, in the nomenclature. So you'll always know that looking for chanterelles, if you come across ones with that green enrolled margin, it's, it's almost uh, certain that you've got even Tate Ruiz. Um, of, of course, someone could actually uh, sequence these and find they're a complex. Um, but from what I understand, they've been fairly well elucidated. Uh, and this is one that you can key to, to near certainty because of that feature. Um, now, oh, unfortunately, the green color is always not necessarily as prominent across all of the individuals of the species, and that makes it a little more difficult. When you find ones that are more brown in color um, than that kind of like viscid green that's on the outside, it really makes it, you know, um, a little bit more ambiguous. So if, if you find one, uh, it would be really, really good to get that natural context color picture as soon as possible so it doesn't lose that green color. Um, and, you know, it, if you find one that uh, lacks the green, it's probably going to look a little bit like uh, Cantharellus corsophilus or even like a little bit like maybe uh, Louisiana that's lacking the red in color um, because there's such a short um, ratio between the length of the site and the cap and its enrolled margin, but um, it's it's that green color that is really definitely the defining feature and makes it kind of a, a dead giveaway. A lot of those chanterelles that just have that wavy margin feature. Right? Yeah, a lot of chanterelles, but some don't. Some mm -hmm. some have a, a margin that's you know not necessarily as uh, 
enrolled, but more be kind of flat, like when it flattens out. But some of them, even into maturity, the margin like stays really well enrolled, and that's a defining feature. On some of them, it'll even be lighter in color, and that makes it really easy to see that margin. What were the ones that you found? What are those? I'm I'm assuming that these are in uh, the ten Weithrix complex, but uh, I am not totally sure. Um, and it would be nice to if if some of these uh, do end up in an herbarium, it would be good that if some of them got sequenced. So uh, this is the smooth chanterelle, uh, the classic smooth chanterelle. Uh, Cantharellus lateritius, um, you'll notice compared to the uh, confluence, it is not splitting from, it just dropped out. Yeah. Uh, is that it? No, no. no, that's craterellus. Okay, it dropped out. We'll just pick up the image. Yeah. Yeah, they're all the questions. Yeah. So uh, the craterellus lateritius, it is. Um, this is really my favorite chanterelle um, to find in Texas. Uh, I just love the smooth uh, chanterelles in there. They typically do have an odor, um, not necessarily as strong as Craterellus odoratus, but the apricot odor on these is really prominent. Um, just sticking your face into a basket of one of these is an experience uh, that you will remember for the rest of your life. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they actually, they do taste really wonderful. Um, and the, the way that you distinguish these uh, is really by, yes, looking at the di distribution, they're not growing from a same split uh, single stipe. Um, but the problem with this is, is that now, okay, so they did find what they thought was uh, Cantharellus uh, lateritius in Mexico in a tropical oak forest, and they sequenced it and it's something new. So the ones in Texas may or may not represent uh, a cryptic species complex. Um, and it's starting to be understood that worldwide, worldwide smooth chanterelles represent a very diverse um, kind of uh, section of the, uh, the genus. That's a hard to name uh, shape of a cat. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what would you call that? It's an in, it, so it's like a trumpet um, shape. The margin is, is slightly enrolled, but not really. Um, that smooth surface and that <laughs> buttery yellow color is unmistakable. And if you notice the as the uh, the underside of the pileus ages, it will turn a more pale color, almost kind of a pinkish color. Um, I've noticed that the spores from these tends to be a little bit more noticeable than other chanterelles. I've had them drop in the basket, and parts of the wooden basket have turned kind of a whitish pink. So they're prolific spore producers. Yeah, they're prolific <laughs> spore producers, and you could probably actually get a print. From one of these if you tried to which is you know a lot of people overlook that uh in in other aspects of mushroom identification but it can be quite useful um with cantharellas uh in terms of whether the spores are white or pink or um tan or gray um that kind of spectrum of spore it's color. One, of the, one of the only genuses i know that have like such a wide variety of yeah. combinations in, in their spores. In its own <laughs> spores yeah right yeah <laughs> Typically, you don't see that in other genuses, so um, it's something to pay attention to. Um, also, the the base of these is typically somewhat a little bit flared towards the bottom of the the stipe there, and then you'll see that that. Uh, can you zoom in a little closer here? No, up, go up, right there. Yeah, in that cap right there. So if you can see. Even though it is smooth, there are some little lamellar full gill ridge things going on there. They're just very subdued. Um, so when they're they're that subdued and they're not prominent, then you're generally looking at, at what's classified as a smooth chanterelle. Um, and then you can take the features from the growth, whether it's seispatose or whether it's individual, um, to determine between um, uh, Cantharellus lateritius and um, you know the Craterellus odoratus and uh, Cantharellus confluence. So we're going to go to Craterellus Odoratus next, I believe, and that's another one in this kind of smooth chanterelle complex. There it is. Now, this one used to be in genus Cantharellus, um, but some work was done genetically that determined this is actually not as closely related to Cantharellus uh, as it is other members of Craterellus, which you might know. Um, I should have included in this, I don't know why I did, but I forgot. Um, black trumpets, that's one that's in 
create a relis. Um, and the reason being, it, it got moved because of the, the, the genetic analysis, but also morphologically, they are different from other smooth chanterelles because the, the if you notice the skin, uh, not the skin, the uh, kind of layer in between the uh, outer and inner tissue is very thin. Like the flesh on them is very thin to where they're almost hollow on the inside of the stipe. Um, and that kind of like goes down throughout the stipe. Um, and they'll, they'll have this um, sespatose kind of growth where they're clustered and they look like, you know, little trumpets or little horns uh, with a very, very uh, distinguishing thin kind of like paper thin uh, uh, tissue. It's so almost, it's almost like they gave up forming that cap. Huh? <laughs> uh, it's almost like they did, but it's fully formed. Like these are, these are how they look fully formed. So uh, it, it really looks more like a horn of plenty or, um, you know, a, a, a trumpet. It has that shape and the hollowness kind of like, goes down further from the gap in the cap into the stem. And in between that hollowness, it's, it's a very thin tissue. So uh, Craterellus odorata smells really strong. That's why it has uh, the, the name, uh, that apricot smell with these is probably more prominent than any other chanterelle. So um, I find these a lot, I'm very excited. And I, I love these two as a, a culinary mushroom. Um, but I typically, I just like, they, they look kind of weird. So chefs and uh, people don't really like them as much as the the real big uh, smooth uh, intact laterites um, so uh, you'll de definitely find them in pine uh, they'll they'll be a lot in pine but they also will be in the mixed hardwood bottomlands that kind of interface with the pine again you can see the poor sandy soil um, that they they favor um, you'll definitely come across uh, situations where these will be really, really similar to uh, Cantharos lateritius, but if you kind of break it open and get into that flesh and see how thin it is, if it's much thinner than a typical chanterelle, and you've also got this sesquitose pattern, then you can delineate between uh, lateritius and confluence. Uh, so. so this one right here, uh, you would think is probably like three or four different specimens stuck together like this one here. I would think that they're kind of safe for toast. Like, look, you can see right here. Yeah. So it's this got like, that kind of uh, candle bra, safe for toast uh, yeah. growth pattern. And really yeah, it's really odd, but it's more typical for craterellas. And if you ever find a lot of black trumpets, you'll see that black trumpets can grow like that as well, where they have this kind of safe for toast pattern. Um, and they have that also that kind of really paper thin, uh, almost hollow configuration of the flesh. Do you know the size of these? Are they kind of? These like, are typically diminutive. They're not going to be as big as the, um, the yeah, as a regular Cantharellus uh, letter T. And, and most most members of Craterellus are smaller than Chanterelles. Um, they're typically a little bit smaller, a little bit more delicate. They kind of fall apart in your basket. Again, that's they don't end up looking very appealing by the time you get back home, and that's why they're not as appealing to chefs or as valuable. But they smell great um, and they taste great. They uh, don't hold their texture as well in dishes as other chanterelles. So maybe it might be better to use these uh, in a soup. Uh, one of my favorite ways to prepare chanterelles is uh, August Escoffier's uh, cream of mushroom soup. Um, right. And it's a, it's a very, very labor intensive preparation. <laughs> uh, you're making a custard while you're making a sauce, while you're making a puree. And you know, you're dirtying up a lot of stuff in the kitchen, um, but it really, really highlights that um, that subtle, fruity, delicate odor. It kind of lets it shine through. Um, so that's one of my favorite dishes to uh, use. As the especially smelly chanterelles, I'll make uh, the cream of mushroom soup with them. Any other questions? Ah, here we go. This is one of my favorites. And this one took me many years to actually get into, um, but I did find some here in North Texas, which I'm really proud of. Actually, yeah, that was a good spot. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> Cantharos Luisii, uh, it's, it's named after uh, David P. Lewis, who is a prominent author on many North American species of uh, fungi, including uh, our Gulf Coast chanterelles. Um, and he actually owns uh, property on which these grow in a, in a mixed hardwood bottom floodplain with pine interspersed. Um, and the identifying feature of these is they're really kind of like deep uh, red, a ruby color that 
kind of starts uh, at the center of the cap and will fade outward. As it ages, it'll kind of get, you know, yellow. You'll, you'll see the margin too is never um, uniform. It's very uh, wavy and very uh, varied. Um, the, the margin is also slightly enrolled on these two. Um, and then we have the, uh, the stem, which maintains this kind of bruising color from being handled almost immediately. It bruises that uh, little brownish, uh, yellowish. I don't know if you can see that there. Um, but these uh, identifying features of it will be the, uh, the kind of ratio of the cap to the stem is never really uh, very long. It's, it's almost even the, the diameter of the cap is usually just a little bit shorter than the length of the, the stipe. Um, and these are kind of rare. Uh, you really don't see them a lot of places. Uh, they seem to have kind of a restricted habitat, even amongst uh, these hardwood bottomland forests and floodplains that they're found in. Uh, and they are a little bit smaller too. They're a little bit on the, you know, more diminutive side of other chanterelles. And they're also really easy to miss. That's the one thing about yeah. them is that red really cap, mean. when it's got a, a red oak leaf, you know, and some pine duff <laughs> over it, it's almost invisible. It's like they're, re these are the really camouflaged chanterelles and you'll, you, you will have to get down on your knees sometimes to uncover duff and find these because they blend in so well. Um, but if you do definitely mark it on iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer and give yourself props, because uh, you found a really cool, rare uh, yeah. mushroom. We'll mark it, but put it somewhere else. Not I know. Right. <laughs> 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 you can do a page anonymous, right? You can't do it with that. Just say, you know, general area, general region in the city, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, Shannon Rolls. Not, not to eat, but just to find because it's cool and it's kind of rare. Um, so, you know, something to micro nerd out on. This is in our area here. You yeah. Find this in our area. Yeah, you'll find us in DFW. But, and yeah. not Arlington. I found them in Denton County okay. and one spot in Denton County. They're not widely distributed there. And I'm thinking maybe it's because I'm not noticing them as much. You know, when I'm out looking for chanterelles, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for those bright yellow yeah. egg yolk, uh, little golden flashes. And uh, I really need to be more of concentrating on everything, you know, taking in all the fungi that are there and then uh, seeing where, you know, these kind of pop out where they blend in on the forest floor. I think these are very selective on their hosts as well. Uh, I've, I've found them uh, certain spots right next to certain trees. And I forgot what the name of that tree was, but. Uh, the ones that I found were the, the, the ones time. that I found were definitely in a post oak <laughs> environment. Um, but I can imagine they can live on oaks that are interspersed with pines just because those oaks are the main host species. Um, David Lewis says he finds them in this hardwood uh, floodplain bottoms, which yeah. I can imagine, you know, there's oak interspersed with the pine and the hickory and cypress and all these other types of species. So um, yeah, so it is a limited habitat. Um, that's the reason why you may not see them everywhere, but I'm also guessing too, the other reason is because they, they blend in so well. Um, but there's still uh, something to look out for, and uh, I hope you find some. They're really cool. Um, this one is is kind of a more recently described, relatively new to science, um, Cantharellus quercifilus, uh, and it can sometimes, in some people's opinion, uh, really really look like the Lubicii, but it doesn't have that red. It's more of a uh, brown kind of like um, I would say like chocolate milk brown or it's really like a brown, huh? yeah but it, that deep brown color uh, along the cap and the stem without the red uh, is really what distinguishes them and they also have really kind of heavy uh inter can you i don't know you can't zoom in but you can see the intervenation on them is yeah. really quite heavy now these are definitely in a really restricted habitat these are exclusively with oaks um, and that's why in the name uh, quercophilus uh, because of the the genus um, Quercus or Quercus that they're associated with. So you typically want to focus on a post oak savanna uh, to find these. And even in, within those habitats, they're kind of limited. Um, these so, are kind of weird. They have like that uh, zonation like that you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. Some of them, but some of them, uh, most of them, they don't really have that. Yeah, and they, these have a bruising too. You can see in the cross section where it's bruised oh, brown okay. on the inside. Yep. Oh, I thought that might have been maggots. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's a cross. It's cross sectional. So, 
the uh, bruising on them is one way to tell too. It looks like the stipe also bruises a little bit when you handle it. Um, these are definitely more rare. I think they've only been observed maybe once or twice in Texas. So uh, if you if you do find some and you do observe them, you're you're into a, a pretty rare uh, part of this uh, genus, and it also may represent a species complex. I don't think there's been a whole lot of work done on these. Uh, it, the habitat is a little restricted and therefore the data on them is kind of lacking. So we may not uh, really understand uh, totally yet if this is a definitive species or if it represents a complex, but there's so, another uh, opportunity there to uncover some new new species. This one's kind of similar to the Louisiana. You know. It is, it is, except it's missing that ready. Yeah, that was yep. a lot more deep. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, here we go. Um, okay, and this is my uh, least favorite Chanterelle. Um, <laughs> it's Cantharellus minor. I really, I, they kind of annoy me because they're so tiny. You can see that it's an oak leaflet right there. Is that a water oak? What kind of oak is that? I'm not sure. Is it blackjack or water? It's some kind of oak leaflet, but they, um, they are tiny. They're like really like smaller than a quarter size. They're very delicate. And by the time you get them into a, a skillet, it's kind of hard to really determine if they taste like anything at all because you, you cook them and then like they're down to nothing. So uh, I don't particularly care to find this, uh, but you know, they they definitely perform their ecological role. They're an interesting mushroom and they possibly represent a species complex. I don't think so because of the, the different type collections that have been made across North America seem to uh, sequence as the same thing. So it looks like a lot of the work has been done with this one, but you never know. We're in Texas, we're at the extant range of a lot of species. So maybe there might be some cryptic ones in there. Uh, but the really easy identifying feature of this one is, is bright fluorescent yellow all the way through. Um, you'll have like a very delicate, and sometimes I think that's almost hollow too. You can peel open the inside of that site. Um, it's not a substantial chanterelle, like they're really, really small. And the emphasis is in the name uh, Cantharellus minor. Uh, you'll, you'll see them widely distributed. There'll be a lot of them in some places growing uh, in kind of this uh, gregarious configuration, but uh, you know, finding them is just like, okay, well, what do I do with this? You could put it in your basket and it'll fall through the holes in the basket. It's just so tiny. Um, and yeah, if you have other chanterelles, you throw them in the basket, they get crushed. Uh, chefs are like, what is this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's just kind of, uh, it's a cool mushroom, you know, cool to look at, but not really too interesting to me culinarily um, and not really taxonomically uh, interesting as well. It seems like they've, they've done all the work on describing this pretty, pretty uh, specifically. Um, so that's Cantharellus minor. So we got one more slide. Oh, there you go. So there's some good online resources. Um, to use when you're trying to key or identify chanterelles. Uh, TexasMushrooms.org is a really good one. Um, uh, Alexei Sergeyev is the one that uh, he runs and manages and posts the pictures on this. And a lot of the images from this presentation uh, came from there. So he's got a, quite a wide collection of other fungi too that have occurred in Texas. And his observations are pretty spot on. Um, not all of them are, are, I would say, you know, research grade, but they're very close. Uh, Mushroom Expert is really good. Um, that would be Michael Kuo's site. Uh, he's got a really good key for North American chanterelles. Um, he is uh, one of the ones that kind of, you know, poo poos the whole Sibarius, uh, you know, this ambiguation that everyone tries to put on chanterelles. He's like, you know, there's really a lot better ways to key them out. And he's got one of the best keys. Uh, Mushroom Observer. Is really good. It's it's a um, website you can post uh, observations of different fungi, and experts can comment and uh, put in their two cents. And even there are some experts that are on here that uh, are doing some uh, genetic analysis. So uh, it's a really good way to not only to get information about um, what you're looking at from posting good, high quality pictures, but it's also a good way to network with people that are doing work. Uh, the taxonomic work on these species, because if, you know, you post something interesting, they will likely, you know, find you and contact you about it. Um, but you can also look out and see uh, the different observations in your area, 
see what's around in terms of the genus and um, it's a really useful tool and a really good uh, database for contributing to a greater body of knowledge about uh, mapping the range of these species and um, it's, it's an excellent tool. iNaturalist is very uh, similar, but it's more broad. Instead of just focusing on uh, fungi, the observations that iNaturalist go across all different kinds of species, um, all different kinds of uh, kingdoms, I guess. So it's really, um, it's a great, great tool to uh, make a post and get an expert observation from a naturalist or from a mycologist that can uh, kind of help you key in what you have a little bit uh, more specifically. And it's also a good tool for mapping. If you're trying to find a species that you haven't located before, you can pull up the uh, search feature, type in your species name, and then go into the map tab and it'll pull up you know, a map of the observations of that species if they exist. So it's a really good tool to utilize and uh, it's very advantageous to people that, um, you know, may have never found a chanterelle and want to know if it grows around them and want to know the places that they grow. That's a great tool for people that just want to uh, find out where they're growing at. Um, and then of course, our website, our northtexasmycology.org, we've got some good resources and we'll continue to have better resources in terms of uh, identification and our fungarium and you know, all the presentations and the other unique information that we find uh, that we'll post on the website. So uh, these are the really good resources. Um, I, I also forgot to put the apps in there. Don't forget your, your app resources for maps, uh, base map, Onyx. Oh, yeah. um, I think Gaia Maps is the yeah, same that was like, yeah, that's the other one. Gaia Maps is cool because um, you can apparently uh, put in and track your path. So you can see like where you go into an area and then backtrack your way out through the same path on the map. It supposedly helps really well with not getting lost. Um, I I like base maps uh, just because that's just the one I've gotten into using. But uh, all these tools are really really uh, good. All right. So um, do you use all trails at all for mapping? Like I haven't used I haven't used all trails yet. Um, is that a similar feature to Gaia where you can track your, your steps, your paces? Yes, okay. because it's, I'm sure Gaia can be operate like offline. So yeah, the offline feature. So, yeah. That's a big one. Uh, I, if you're going to use one of those apps, I would definitely get one that has the offline feature because when you're out in the national forest, you don't have signal. So you want to be able to pull up your maps and any research that you've done and put layers onto those maps or spots that you've marked you want to be able to see them so downloading the offline maps is really uh, one of the best way to utilize those apps um and then i've got some work cited here i believe on the next page yeah are there any mushroom conventions in texas um festivals. Festivals. yeah I mean, conventions or festivals. we have parades um, but, okay so there is a texas <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, did I go over time? No, 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 no. right on time. Sweet. Um, um, so yeah, there is there is a uh, mushroom fest, Texas mushroom festival officially, and it almost has nothing to do with mushrooms. It's like the uh, I forget what city it's held in. It's Madison. You know, I heard of that too. But it's I almost like it's... their chamber of commerce festival. There's like one booth it's with Monterey really mushrooms, like you and, and they're it. selling oyster and portobello. I'm not oyster. <laughs> They're selling button and portobello fajitas. Oh, like no. that's the extent of that's the mushroom so. festival. So, Everything so else is like wine, question, cars. We're, we're trying to get to the <laughs> stage to where we can uh, collaborate with the different mycological associations within Texas to host a conjunction uh, somewhere in the middle of Texas, preferably down south near Austin. Because I've been asking Angel Schatz, who's the president from Central Texas Mycological Society, Right when we first started, I, want, I approached her trying to start an official Texas uh, mushroom festival that is separate from them. But was <laughs> something that we did that actually yeah, they got the name. mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. And then we bring talent from all across America to try to uh, give lectures and presentations on various fields and topics. Uh, so far, she was kind of hesitant, uh, so we decided to do our own thing until she gets on board, which we're still trying to 
negotiate um, an event in the future. So that's still a possibility. But for now, we are hosting uh, our Halloween foray with Alan Rockefeller uh, this year. And I'm also bringing people like David P. Lewis, who's this uh, chanterelle expert uh, and wrote the book on the Gulf states, uh, mushrooms. Uh, he's the former president of the Gulf states mycological society, as well as Jay Justice, who wrote the book on Amanita. Uh, he'll be attending as well. And uh, I'm really honored to have this much talent coming from all different parts to conjoin here in North Texas <laughs> in our backyard. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Alan is coming to give a presentation on psilocybe, which is a psychedelic genre of mushrooms, as well as doing a mycoscopy workshop. Uh, so that's where I mentioned he'll be bringing his $15,000 microscope. So um, I haven't, that's my phone right there. I was going to message him to try to, <laughs> to try to figure that out and get you more details, but maybe give me your information and I'll try to get it to you afterwards. So we are trying to host festivals. They are in the works. Um, if you want to pay attention to what's happening in the news, please sign up to AMS newsletter through our website, Fungi Times. Um, and also, uh, you know, if you haven't heard our iNaturalist project, you can sign up through our website as well. It's on our homepage. There's a button that will allow you to join our iNaturalist project. And that'll allow you to record your finds in our little database, right? So we selected the entire North Texas area and whatever somebody finds, it will go into our little database and it will be preserved as a record, right? So we've got somewhere like 40, 300 observations so far. Yeah, yeah so. For such a short time. Yeah, we'd like, to, we'd like to get it up there to like 100,000 or so. <laughs> <laughs> Our region is within two hours drive from the Metroplex. So whichever side you're on, if you're on Dallas side, you drive two hours. We get all the way out to about Tyler. We haven't done anything out there yet. Maybe we should do something one day because it, it's interesting to go to different habitats, right? <clears throat> a two hour drive in Texas will likely take you to a different entirely different uh, ecology, right? So a uh, two hour drive from here to East Texas, we you get into the pine, right? And you go north, you're almost to Oklahoma and you got like the really sandy red clay soil. Yeah. <laughs> so the terrain here, you know, if you drive two hours west, you're in the desert. <laughs> yeah. So the terrain here is a very um, variable and we're gonna try to take advantage of that. The reason why we, uh, our monthly forays are concentrated within the Metroplex is because the conveniency, right? For folks that a majority of us are located within this area, well, I'm not trying to make you all drive two hours to our foray. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there is a double-edged sword here and we're not reaching people that are on the outer limits, right? Because I do get people that come to the group and they're like, hey, we live in Tyler. Yeah, you know we're <laughs> two hours. There's the East Texas Mycological Society. They're not really that um, active or even really established yet. So I feel bad for them because that's kind of where we were about like last year, right? We were like a Facebook group and we were just figure out where we can meet at to find mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, you know, now we got a little bit of more structure and we're figuring things out. So I'm trying to get to areas where. Um, maybe we can host like a weekend for a, you know, somewhere uh, out like east, in Tyler, you know, yeah. in Tyler, someday. In I mean, I know it's not North Texas, but we can definitely go out on Lone Star Trail. At least yeah. Once. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and you know, that's something to pay attention to, and we'll see it through our website, uh, you know, broadcasting all of our news and events and stuff that we'll come up with. Uh, shortly, uh, you'll see it on our website. And, yeah. Right now, I like to highlight Michael is <laughs> in, in the classroom. Uh, he's really been helping us out a lot tremendously within this past few weeks. Um, uh, behind the scenes, we're revamping the website and making it a lot more streamlined and less cluttered <laughs> and, and a lot more friendly user experience, right? So that's where we're aiming towards. 
and Michael has really been helping out a lot for that. So I'd like to. Thank you. Thank you. Prior to that, we've had our web master in India, so you can imagine <laughs> how <laughs> difficult it is. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, yeah. it's not just the communication. <laughs> <laughs> it's just different time zones, you know, and, and I'm glad to have everything back here in North Texas. So, um, and a couple more announcements real quick. Our next somewhat foray, uh, it's not official NTMA foray. Uh, we're helping out with this lady named Susanna Dooling uh, from TC Rice Nature Preserve. I think it's that way. Carrollton. Carrollton. Yeah, yeah. Carrollton is like that way. So um, TC Rice Nature Preserve, I have never been there. You know, um, she's asked us to do a bio blitz, which uh, we're going to do an emphasis on recording our species into iNaturalist. So not only will it go into our project, but it will also go into the TC Rice Nature Preserve and then they'll know what's there in their nature preserve, right? So that's what I've told them that, of course, we'll lend out by hand. So uh, if you haven't seen, it's not on our website um, because I didn't really make it official because we're not really hosting it, right? So this was just a, a Facebook uh, thing that uh, Susanna Dooling had asked us to participate in. And from that, I agreed. So you technically have to RSVP by sending term email and. If you need the details, if you're not on Facebook, if you need the details. Maybe I'll put it on the newsletter. Yeah, 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 put it on the newsletter, that'd be great. So that's next week, next Saturday on the 11th. That's the next time you can go out and look at us and do some mushrooms. Uh, and other than that, the next monthly regular NTMA for is on the 26th. We're gonna be doing it at Cedar Ridge Preserve. And it should be a lot of fun if we get some rain. <laughs> More rain, yes. <laughs> Keep it coming. Yeah. Weekend, July. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, and our next class uh, will be over poisons, oh, poison. poisonous yeah. mushrooms, right? So, um, Dr. Dennis Benjamin is a good friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah. He wrote the book on poisons and panaceas, which uh, was a fantastic book came out in the mid 90s on poisonous mushrooms, right? So this guy is the real deal. He uh, is uh, been working with Brit, which is a botanical research institute in Fort Worth. And um, he's also a pediatrician. He's an oncologist. He's an oncologist. Well. Yeah. He's yeah. the people from all the world calls him about mushroom poisoning. Yeah. So we're really honored to have this guy in our backyard. <laughs> and, yeah. and I've been trying to get him to come teach a class for a few months, but he's been busy with his own life, doing his own thing. But he managed to make some uh, time for us. And I think the next class is July, first Saturday. Saturday. Every class that we have is the first Saturday of the month. So that's what we've been designated. It's kind of easy to remember. So. Uh, from now on, that's what we're going to be planning our class schedule. And I think for the next two classes, we're scheduled. So the next one's poison, poisonous mushrooms. Uh, Dr. Dennis Benjamin will be here. And then after that, in August, Kron will be running the cultivation class again. And he'll be here with a bunch of microtubes and passing out. And everybody's going to have a bunch of fun. So, yeah. September, we might get a guy who does mycelial communication. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can't keep this. So, <laughs> so much going There's so much on. It's, so much it's going hard. On. It's hard to tie everything together, but hopefully I'll make it. Um, this guy, <laughs> he contacted Ava, I think, uh, a little over a week ago. And he's on the forefront of experimenting with mycelial communication and the electrical network that it forms within mm. mycelial networks. So um, he's asked us to kind of support his research. And of course, our goal is to promote and advance mycology. So if we don't do that, then why are we here? Right? Yeah. So, so of course, you know, we're all over to help you out. Um, well, he, he's a, a Neurophysiologist, yeah, uh, and, and he's published several papers on some disease. I'm forgetting the name <laughs> that yeah. affects the brain. And uh, he's asked us to try to help out in um, actually moving forward with this project, hmm. which nobody really 
Uh, no, it's because there's nothing really uh, written in literature about this at all. Um, I think there was just one Jimmy Kimmel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jimmy yeah. Kimmel show on it just recently. And something, this uh, small little paper was published on the internet, but, which is more of clickbait that had like the cool title, like mushrooms talking to each other. Because <laughs> you, know? you see a lot of uh, mushroom music yeah. on TikTok and yeah. stuff. So. Yeah, so that'll be uh, our class in September. So uh, we have our classes lined up for the next three months. Uh, oh, one more. I'm sorry. Microdose X uh, is a big, I'm guessing, a big organization uh, dedicated to psychedelics, right? And um, we have our previous Texas Mycology Conference in Arlington was hosted by Garrett Wilker Wilkerson and uh, Unicorn Grow Bags. So Garrett uh, is also going to be hosting this event with Microdose X and asked us to be a part of it. And of course, I said, yeah. <laughs> and this is going to be five hours of psychedelic talks for 20 bucks uh, in Arlington at the records. There's like a where we were at Division Brewery. There's a record shop next to it. So I'm guessing we're going to be indoors at the record shop. And it's only going to be about 50 to uh, maybe 100. I'm not sure, 75 maximum allowed. Because it's a small. What's the date little, on that one? Excuse me? What's the date on that one? Uh, August 6th. So that day, we're planning to do a cultivation class in the daytime. And then we're, after here, we're leaving to go to that. Uh, uh, I don't know what that's called yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, a, with the, it's $20 to get in, or it's a $50. He floated around the idea to get a little San Pedro cactus, some sport prints. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, Are tickets on sale yet? No, uh, I'm trying to get more details from him, and then you know we'll have it in our shop and our website pretty soon. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. That'll be in Arlington on August sixth. What day uh, of the week is that? Saturday. Uh, oh, is yeah. that when we're doing? I think it's gonna be in the afternoon from like two to like seven. Is that the same day we're doing our presentation? Yeah, so we'll do oh, okay. the cultivation well, classes here and then afterwards, if anybody wants to join the psychedelic <laughs> conference. <laughs> I think I think it'll be a psychedelic conference. I think that's what it's called, but I'm not sure. Uh, so yeah, anybody have any questions? Questions regarding organization <laughs> or memberships or anything? Uh, also, I know we have a problem with, uh, with the website. If anybody is having to pay for forays, please let me know. Uh, we're trying to figure that out uh, on the back end. I got a message earlier from somebody that's still getting uh, charged as a member. <laughs> so uh, it, it was because of our previous webmaster. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, our previous webmaster, uh, he, he kind of messed things up for us. and. We paid him to fix it. He never did. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, if you ever have any problems with the website, please let me know because we kind of ran into some big issues. But uh, with that being said, thank you all for coming in. Thank you, everybody, for the awesome presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody at Zoom for, for sticking out. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I was going to say, oh, if you. No, if you really want to get specific with these keys, find these papers that these species are described in. Uh, Bart Puig and uh, uh, Valerie Hofstetter have really gone in deep detail in a lot of these papers, uh, much further detail than I went into this presentation. So uh, if you're looking for information about these specific species, you can go to scholar.google.com and you can type in the species and the papers that they've described and will come up typically. Um, there's a few more works that are in this that I, for whatever reason, the other slide didn't make it in here, but uh, they're mostly by uh, Bart Boyk. Um, I think I'm saying his name correctly, I hope so. Um, and he, these, um, these descriptions like go very, very deep in depth. So they're good to have if you're ever in question or if you're ever, you know, really wanna know if what you have is something unique or cryptic. I definitely recommend looking up the literature and don't, whatever you do, don't go to SciHub and pirate the paper and get it for free. That's very naughty. 
go into the DOI number into Sci-Hub or Z-Library and flip the free paper. You're going to hurt the major publishing companies. They're going to, you know, not be able to buy a third yacht for their shareholders or whatever. So don't do that. Thank you. Does, does anybody have any questions for Patrick? Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Patrick. Thank you so much. Are you working on the website? Yeah. Are you are you sticking with WordPress and just like making the website really have better, or are you trying to create something? Uh, yeah. I ended up moving this to a different platform, so basically there will be less plugins. Yeah. So that plugin menu on the left is very nice. Yes, it is. Yeah. And I got it down. Yeah. So now it's on. Yeah, yeah, that's a shirt. Yeah, I was gonna try and spear them, but I just don't know. Yeah, they cross the I know, like, basically, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. so we'll move our domain. Uh, uh, basically, I mean, I think we're trying to this area is different. I think it's mostly like hardware that makes it out. I got to wear. Like that. Well, I was having a yeah, yeah. Uh, so they have like a super area. But as far as like uploading all the videos and stuff, I don't know. But we, we got into the spring season and had a network. I just really ran out of time. Yeah, that's one of my favorite spots in South Dallas. I have a feature, unfortunately, now. That's why that's why I voted on it, honestly. And I told Sebastian, I was like, I think if we do what like if I try to make this do what you're asking for, it's gonna be like a hundred bucks. So now it's like a fair maybe. Okay, Randy, you have to go back behind like the nearest. This is on that yeah, you know
But I would say X amount for one kind of subscription, like as you add more, it was like the cost of more for the member area was where I would put stuff to. <laughs> I would sort of say, yeah, like if you're like, if you need some commercial, you want to get a I mean, I would imagine the food would be more expensive. on the average. So, we're kind of like that free curriculum. Thanks for helping us on your website. Thanks for helping us on your website. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, 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 I gotta run to the bathroom. Oh, this thing's still like Zoom recording. I'm like, I gotta pee. Show me how to do it.